Church State Relations at the Birth of the Irish Free State. Professor Paul Rouse, uh, whose short and snappy title of Land and Radicalism will be up after that. And Paul has the distinction also of being my tutor here in, in, in UCD back in 1997. And Professor Lindsay Byrne, or Erna Byrne, my apologies, of the School of History of uh, University College Cork. And her paper will be Family and Vulnerability in the Irish Free State. So we'll start with Dr. Cran. As he's taking the podium, I'll just give you a brief introduction. He's uh, published widely on the Irish Revolution 1912 to 1923 and Irish Catholicism. His most recent book, Cahill Brewer, An Indomitable Spirit, was co-authored with Jared Hanley. As I said, his paper today is entitled An Intertwining of Faith, Fatherland and Self-Interest, the Church-State Relations at the Birth of the Irish Free State. Sir, you have 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Danny. And just before I start, I want to extend my thanks uh, to Conor Mulva and to Jenny Costello for their Herculean efforts at bringing this wonderful conference together. The institutional significance of the Catholic Church is a central theme of 20th century Irish history. Three broad phases can be discerned in the Church's relationship with the state. The period of the Irish Revolution, the exertion of unprecedented influence in independent Ireland, roughly from the 20s to the 60s, and then a gradual undermining of the Church's previously uncontested dominance from the late 60s uh, onward, when economic and social transformation and the new teaching of the Second Vatican Council altered the context of Church-State relations. This afternoon, I will confine myself to an overview of the first two phases. Between 1918 and 1923, the stance of the Irish Catholic hierarchy was characterised by repudiation of political violence, but not the goal of Irish independence, obeisance to the legally constituted government, advocacy of majority rule, deep hostility towards partition, and perhaps most of all, a desire for peace, order and social stability. The hierarchy was committed in Patrick Murray's compelling phrase to sustaining the authority of a nascent Irish state and was committed to the survival of the treaty settlement. There was a belief among the bench of bishops that while not perfect, the Anglo-Irish treaty facilitated the progress of the country and to reject it would spell disaster. Against a deteriorating political and military situation, most Catholic bishops used their Lenten pastorals in February 1922 to bolster support for the settlement. For Archbishop Edward Byrne of Dublin, who you can see on screen, um, the quote, unsympathetic, wasteful and unintelligent rule of men alien, uh, alien to us in blood and traditions would be replaced by a native one with knowledge of our people's needs. The hierarchy treated the June 1922 election as a referendum on the treaty. At its most fundamental for the bishops, the key question was one of whether the lawfully expressed will of the Irish people would prevail or not. Individually and collectively, the bishops backed the provisional government. This included producing at the behest of the cabinet a politically partisan pastoral in October 1922 that was linked to the government's offer of an amnesty to Republicans. Published in the press on the 11th of October, the pastoral sought to strip the Republican campaign of any political or moral legitimacy, to appeal for obedience to the legit legitimate government, to threaten the removal of the sacraments from those engaged in unlawful rebellion and the suspension of clergy giving spiritual aid to the Republic and to make an appeal to Republicans to pursue their grievances through constitutional means, a plea that had been repeated uh, since the outbreak of the conflict. The issue of ecclesiastical sanctions for infractions of the moral law had been raised by individual bishops before the October pastoral, a point insufficiently emphasized in the historiography of this period. For example, um, in July 1922, Cardinal Michael Logue of Armagh contemplated excommunication uh, for, the, for parishes in Carlingford and Dundalk. This, he believed, would little affect, quote, 
the desperate characters who fear neither God nor man, but it might de de deter some people who have a rag of conscience left from cooperating with or aiding or abetting them." End of quote. Outraged by the attempt to use religious sanctions to enforce a political standpoint on a constitutional matter, Republicans um, petitioned this man here, uh, Pope Pius XI. And in March 1923, the Pope dispatched uh, Monsignor um, Salvatore Luzio to report on the Irish situation. For his troubles, he was cold-shouldered by church and state authorities. The October pastoral may have emboldened the government in its ruthless prosecution of the civil war. Privately, the bishops were appalled at the policy of executions. But Episcopal appeals for clemency were ignored, a reminder to us of the limited political influence of the bishops at this time. For instance, Archbishop Byrne visited his friend, W.T. Cosgrave, uh, in a failed effort to prevent the executions without trial of Rory O'Connor, Lee Mellows, Joseph McKelvey and Richard Barrett on the 8th of December in reprisal for the killing of Sean Hales the day before. In a subsequent letter to Cosgrave, the Archbishop deemed the executions, quote, not only unwise, but entirely unjustifiable from the moral point of view. However dismayed their lordships were in private at the excesses of the Irish government and the National Army during the Civil War, no public condemnation was issued. In this, there was clearly an element of self-interest. The unpalatable reality of a Northern Unionist government hostile to Catholic interests increased the hierarchies resolved to secure the Irish Free State and the opportunities that it promised, not least for the Church. During the early months of 1923, Episcopal pronouncements emphasised the necessities of stable government, constitutional political action and unimpeded elections. For instance, in his Lenten pastoral in February 1923, Archbishop Thomas Gilmartin of Toom, you can see on screen, urged, quote, for the gun, the revolver, the bomb and the mine, substitute argument. For terrorism, substitute an appeal to the dignity and intelligence of the voter. Bishop Michael Fogarty of Killaloo uh, denounced Rep the Republican campaign as fanaticism and not patriotism. Several bishops raised fears that the widespread disorder had weakened the social fabric in the shape of increasing intemperance, illegal distillation, disregard for parental authority, and perhaps most worrying of all, uh, widespread, immodest, all-night foreign dancing. In August 1923, the Catholic hierarchy and clergy were remarkably active during the election campaign. They championed the record of W.T. Cosgrave's ministry and encouraged the electorate to pass a positive verdict on it. Churchmen of all ranks emphasised the need to uphold the authority of the state, to safeguard the stability of the political system to place the arduous task of nat national reconstruction in capable hands, and to ensure that justice and peace would prevail after the sufferings of the Civil War. This was encapsulated in a letter from Bishop Daniel Cohalan of Cork, read in all churches in his diocese on the morning of the election. And there is an image of Cohalan. The bishop suggested that the electors should vote for those who would cooperate in establishing statehood and stable government in the country, for those who would give security to life and home and property, and who would restore social life in the land in conformity with God's commandments. The clergy followed the lead of their bishops and were active in a variety of ways in the election, as organisers, chairmen of common and branches, nominators or seconders of election candidates. Remarkably, in Limerick, four of the five Cumling Isle candidates were proposed by priests. There are also examples, of course, of clerical support for Republican candidates. So staying in Limerick, uh, James Colbert, brother of the 1916 martyr Conn, um, who was a successful candidate, had been proposed by two uh, curates. Some priests published letters in support of local candidates. Uh, Patrick uh, Daly, uh, parish priest of Castle Pollard, 
trusted that the voters would have the patriotic spirit to recognise what the government candidate uh, represented. And I quote from his letter, you stand for ordered government versus anarchy. You stand for the protection of life and property. You stand for the building up of the ruins that strew the country. You stand for the resurrection of Ireland, for its restored moral and financial status. In many respects, the outcome of the election eased the anxieties of the hierarchy. Although underwhelming, the result endorsed the treaty, the constitution, the Irish Free State, and the principle of majority rule, which the bishops had vehemently defended. Second, the abstentionist policy of Republicans ensured that Common Gael possessed a commanding majority in the Dáil, thereby delivering the hierarchy's cherished aim of political stability. Third, Republican candidates and voters embraced constitutional politics in a largely peaceful campaign, in what Bill Kassan has termed a mechanism of de-radicalization. Notably, during the Republican hunger strike in late 1923, Episcopal appeals to the government instanced Republican adherence to constitutional methods. The embrace by Republicans of constitutional politics satisfied the Episcopal desire to draw patriotism away from the gun. Now, the creation of two political jurisdictions on the island had significant consequences for the Catholic Church. Among the northern bishops, enthusiasm for the treaty was tempered by anxiety about partition. The big blot on the treaty, as Bishop Patrick McKenna of Clutter put it. But there was never any question that partition would compromise the religious unity of the Catholic Church, despite the fact uh, that, as the map on screen illustrates, four dioceses, that's the four in yellow, straddled the border, and two, that's the two in blue, uh, were located entirely within Northern Ireland. Partition proved deeply traumatic for the Catholic Church, given the number of its adherents in Northern Ireland, the appalling civil strife there between 1920 and 1922, and fears for Catholic voluntary schools. The Northern Catholic ex experience before the Second World War was marked by a sense of being in, but not of, the state. Among church leaders, this only changed um, when the opportunities occasioned by the welfare state in the 1940s demanded greater pragmatism uh, in its relationship with the Northern Ireland government. Northern members of the Catholic hierarchy frequently referred to partition. For example, in May 1922, Patrick O'Donnell, uh, then coadjutor Archbishop of Armagh and future Cardinal, deemed the severance of the six counties from the 26 as unnatural and suggested uh, uh, that, quote, the sooner the dividing line was obliterated, the better for Ireland and the better for Ulster. But he wanted this uh, to be by wise counsel rather than sharp swords. Although partition was abhorred by the bishops, ironically, it enhanced their power in the Irish Free State by producing a remarkably homogenous population. In 1926, Catholics accounted for almost 93% of the population. This had a significant bearing on the state's political and public culture and on the status enjoyed by the Catholic Church. Pragmatism and self-interest characterised church-state relations during the first half-century of independence. The church was uniquely well-placed to contribute to the state-building project in terms of enhancing national unity, providing an unrivaled institutional presence, and inculcating a Catholic moral order. And I'm going to say a few words about each of those areas. After the trauma of the Civil War, Catholicism was an, Im an important bonding force in Irish society. At parish, diocesan and national level, there was a closeness between the people and the church. This helped bind some of the wounds of the Civil War. Many bishops shared friendships with government figures and civil servants, the vast majority practicing Catholics. This facilitated informal lobbying by churchmen. W.T. Cosgrave uh, was a close friend 
um, of Archbishop Byrne of Dublin and Bishop Fogarty of Killaloo. And on screen, you can see him in Blackrock College uh, in 1929 with Archbishop John Harty of Cashel and the Archbishop of Dublin. Um, De Valera was also very close uh, to several uh, churchmen. Here he is uh, with his old Blackrock College classmate, John Dalton, who was Archbishop of Ar Armagh between 1946 and 1963. Um, and this photograph was taken shortly after Dalton uh, was made a cardinal. Now, Sean T. O'Kelly has featured in most papers today, um, so I'm also uh, going to feature him. Uh, and here he is as president, uh, admiring some Episcopal bling. Uh, he's looking there at, uh, at the cardinal's uh, ring. <coughs> now, personal... Uh, relations uh, between um, churchmen and politicians did not always prevent tensions between them. The bishops were unable to prevent the Cosgrave government from establishing diplomatic relations with the Vatican in 1929. Their misgivings ultimately proved groundless, as Pascal Robinson, uh, the first papal nuncio, avoided interfering in domestic church affairs, ensured smooth relations with the Vatican, and enjoyed friendships with political leaders on both sides of the treaty divide, which aided harmonious church-state relations. Both church and state leaders utilized the intertwining of faith and fatherland as a means of differentiating the free state from its former colonial master. The centenary of Catholic emancipation in 1929 um, and the 31st Eucharistic Congress in 1932 were symbolic expressions of a triumphant Catholic nationalism. And that's just one more photograph um, from uh, the celebrations in 1929. Uh, now, these celebrations also allowed pro and anti-treaty sides to demonstrate that they were loyal sons of the church. The devout Catholicism of de Valera and many of his soldiers of destiny helped to ensure continued harmony in church-state relations when Fianna Fáil took office in 1932. Uh, and this photograph gives us a sense of that. Uh, there we can see de Valera in the presence of the papal nuncio and the Archbishop of Dublin. And on the far right of the screen, you can see a young father, uh, John Charles McQuaid, the future um, Archbishop of Dublin, then president of Blackrock College. Now, during the 19th century, uh, the church built up an imposing institutional presence in education, health, and welfare. In the 1920s, this served as a significant stabilizing force. An impecunious Irish government was content for the church to continue to perform significant state functions in these fields. This suited the state because religious labor was cheap or free and capital costs were offset by fundraising from the flock. In turn, church dominance of these areas ensured the state pursued policies in line with church interests. As various commissions of inquiry have dismally revealed, the status enjoyed by the church contributed to deplorably inadequate state oversight. No area of interaction between church and state was more sensitive than that of education. And during the first half century of independence, the church zealously defended its dominant role in the education system. Plentiful vocations and such a vast presence sustained a general Catholic habitus or way of viewing the world, something that has been powerfully investigated uh, by Tom Inglis. The orthodox and legalistic form of Catholicism before the Second Vatican Council, the high level of religious practice and conformity, and the extent to which Irish life was imbued with Catholicism, reinforced this habitus and the church's dominance. Now, the upheavals of the Irish Revolution intensified Episcopal concerns about the denigration uh, and, uh, and degeneration of social conduct. In the 1920s and 1930s, significant elements of the Catholic moral code were enshrined uh, in law particularly in the areas of family relations and of sexual morality. Other forms of morality were largely ignored. The period witnessed the introduction of laws and censorship of films in 1923, publications in 1929, the abolition of the right to divorce, the prohibition on the sale of intoxicating liquor, um, and of course the prohibition on the sale of contraceptives, uh, which was cast solely in terms of public morality rather 
than in terms of women's health. Now, measures such as censorship were not unique to Ireland, of course. What was unique and what did differ was the stringency and the longevity of Irish moral protectionism. So just a, a concluding thought then. Preaching at an Episcopal consecration in June 1923, Thomas O'Doherty, the Bishop of Clonfert, referred to the Episcopal motivations behind the October 1922 pastoral. Unless the divinely appointed interpreters of God's law were to betray their trust and remain as dumb dogs when the wolves were threatening the sheepfold, they were bound to make clear the law of God. O'Doherty hoped that as passions cooled in the aftermath of the Civil War, the Catholic faithful would hearken to the advice of St. Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews to obey your bishops. In terms of the broad phases of church-state relations that I have outlined, O'Doherty's injunction was only fitfully observed during the Irish Revolution and increasingly not adhered to from the 1970s. This suggests that the middle period, the first half century of independence, was exceptional in terms of the church's preponderance, when it acted and was treated with great deference uh, as a veritable, and as we know now, unhealthy state within a state. Sinn Féin, Gurmagaf. Thank you very much. Uh, Dahi, that was a fascinating discussion and uh, it's nice to see that our fascination, our human fascination with bling didn't start with the Kardashians in the last uh, uh, decade and a half. Before we, I introduce our next speaker, just to remind everybody that in, in your uh, programme is the QR code for the Slido app. If you, want to have, if you have any comments, questions for our panel, that's the way to do it and they're moderated and I'll get them and we'll get into the Q&A afterwards. Our next speaker, uh, Paul, if you want to make your way to the podium, is uh, Professor Paul Rice. Uh, of the UCD School of History. Paul's main research interests lie in the history of sport. He has written extensively on the history of Irish sport uh, and he also has looked at the global history of sport. He's a Fulbright scholar and his research also extends to popular culture, the history of the media and the history of agriculture. He uh, writes a weekly column for the Irish Examiner newspaper and presents the Examiner podcast, uh, sporting podcast on Gaelic football. Uh, he, also, um, he also is a co-director of two major public history projects, Century Ireland, the main online portal for the Irish Decade of Commemoration and the GAA Oral History, which is uh, the large, largest oral history project undertaken by any sport or sporting organisation in the world. His, uh, the title of his paper today is Land and Radicalism. I saw Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jenny and for the invitation here today. Uh, it's, it, it, you've done a wonderful job. Longing on a large scale is what makes history, wrote Don DeLillo in his great American novel, Underworld, and a longing for land was one of the great engines of the Irish Revolution. Drawing on the doctrine of James Finton Lawler, who had written that a strong and independent peasantry was the only base on which a people could be improved or on which a nation could safely rest, the rhetoric surrounding the Irish Revolution was drenched in the imagery of agrarianism. More precisely, this was a revolution that promised all things to all people. The landless labourer was to be given land. The small farmer was to have his holding increased. And the larger farmer was to have his position safeguarded. That the remaining landlords would be stripped of their holdings was a given. But if the rebels were to make good on their land commitments, they were now faced with a challenge of not merely freeing Ireland, but also extending, extending its land mass. Some were not prepared to await either military success or miracle. The rural poor, since their moment, had arrived in the middle of the revolution, and it was not long before labourers and small farmers were rallying to the old battle hymn of the land for the people. Whether seeking Conacre or the aggrandizement of small holdings, the motivating force was the seizure of land. From 1917 onwards, estate redistribution, cattle driving, ploughing and stripping, and general agrarian unrest were in full swing. Elsewhere, farm labourers organised in trade unions and threatened strike, strike action. Now, as we all know, patriotism is rarely more sharply displayed than when founded in acute self-interest. And for the strong farmer too, freedom was defined in economic and not constitutional terms. Some reacted to the groundswell of land agitation by covertly participating 
to further expand their own property and their own wealth, while others founded the Irish Farmers Union to defend their existing position. The result was that the new leaders of nationalism made a headlong rush to the middle ground in an attempt to preserve unity and earn respect for responsible leadership. A Dáil Éireann decree was issued on the 29th of June 1920 stating that the present time when Irish people are locked in a life and death struggle with their traditional enemy, it is ill chosen for the stirring up of strife amongst our fellow countrymen and all our energies must be directed towards the clearing out of not the occupiers or this of, or that piece of land, but the foreign invader of our country. Nonetheless, special land courts were set up by the Dáil to curtail the activities of the more radical and to enforce, through the IRA, such redistribution as could be most easily affected. And all the while, the rhetoric rang out. Through all the years of the Irish Revolution, in the construction of an alternative vision to the one offered by the traditional enemy, Gaelic revivalists and revolutionary nationalists alike presented the small farming ideal <coughs> as the genuinely Irish experience. Far from the squalor of industrial cities, and their degrading factories, the Irish would create a vibrant rural landscape of small homesteads and thriving cottage industries. Political independence would ensure the agricultural prosperity which would drive this buoyant, self-sufficient economy. Detail, of course, was ignored and claimed to be excessively divisive. Calmly ignoring market forces, it was claimed that legislative freedom would signify arrival at Babylon, and there, basking on the shores, would be Irish farmers and farm labourers. But, as Liam Skinner wrote in his 1946 memoir, Politicians by Accident, the translation of dreams into realities is no easy task. The agricultural policies of successive Irish governments in the years immediately after the establishment of the Irish Free State, that is to say, the redistribution of land, the promotion of tillage farming, the negotiation of trade agreements and other related endeavours make plain the truth of this assertion. Come in the nail effectively disregarded the social and economic sloganeering which had attended the path to political independence when faced with the realities of government. The primacy of agriculture was enshrined as the government accepted that the economy depended on farming for general prosperity said also that agricultural prosperity depended on the export market, that the export market essentially comprised of Britain, and that by far the most profitable Irish product in Britain was cattle exported on the hoof. And policy now revolved around these essential verities. The new Minister for Agriculture, Patrick Hogan, said in 1924, national development for Ireland, in our generation at least, is practically synonymous with agricultural development. And of course, this meant the championing of farmers continuing to do almost precisely what they had done in the decades before independence. George O'Brien, Professor of National Economics at University College Dublin, neatly summed up the status of farmers in independent Ireland by describing how the st state was designed, and I quote, to maximise farmers' income, because the farmers being the most important section of the economy, everything that raised their income raised the national income of the country. Prosperity among farmers will provide the purchasing power necessary to sustain demand for non-agricultural goods and services, and it was useless to encourage secondary industries unless the primary industry was in a position to purchase their products. So what of land? The Land Commission was established in 1923 and was charged with transferring the land of the remaining large estates from their landlords to smallholders. The Land Commission also took over the work of the Congested Districts Board in rearranging farm holdings in the Western region. In general, the Land Commission was given only limited powers and limited resources. It was to redistribute land, but it was to do so without interfering essentially with property rights and at min minimal cost. Basically, the life of Irish farmers changed hardly at all while Cumann and Nail were in government. The ascent to power of Fianna Fáil in 1932 promised something entirely different. One of the founding aims of Fianna Fáil was to provide for the greatest number uh, possible of families to live on the land 
through greatly increased, uh, intensified redistribution of that land. There were promises also to reassert the notion of self-sufficiency in food production, meaning, of course, that tillage would have to be prioritised ahead of cattle. The substitution of intensive for extensive farming was seen as the key to a revitalised rural society by allowing smallholders improve their incomes and larger farmers to employ more labourers, thus stemming emigration and the notorious drift from the land. A concerted campaign was launched to encourage farmers to convert to tillage production. A bounty was offered for calf skins. Subsidies were introduced for wheat and sugar beet. Import controls were imposed on sugar and tobacco. And relief was offered on rates in proportion to the amount of non-family labour used on farms. By the end of the 1930s, almost nothing had changed in the Irish farm structure. Boiled by subsidies, it is true that the wheat acreage had increased from 22,000 acres to more than 10 times that amount, and that the area of sugar beet grew from 13,000 acres to 51,000 acres. So that suggests change. And these expansions did supply up to 30 and 60% of the national requirement, respectively, in those areas. But the single most important fact is that the overall acreage under tillage in 1939 was only 2% higher than it had been in 1932. That is, there had been a shift in the crops used, but not really in the overall area of tillage production. Despite the economic war and the impact of broader protectionist policies, the number of cattle in the country had also actually increased during the 1930s. Irish farmers continued to cling to livestock. This reality was recognised in the 1938 trade agreements with Britain. Uh, I just want to say in passing that if anybody wants to understand the difficulties in the relationship between Britain and Ireland um, in the middle decades of the century, it is worth going to queue and sitting in front of the negotiations of the trade agreements of 1938, 48, 51, 54 and 57 and look at the manner in which the Irish state was treated by the, by the officials of Her Majesty's Government and the capacity of the Irish officials to respond to that treatment. It is a salutary lesson in post-colonialism and in what happens when a power gets outgunned. It's the kind of lesson that may be playing out again in a different context, currently being experienced in a different way by Her Majesty's officials, I should note. <laughs> As one observer noted, however, in terms of livestock when it comes to Ireland, uh, in that period, the, he wrote in Farmer's Journal later, just at that time, the Irish farmer has taken an oath of allegiance to the almighty Bullock. <laughs> it was this allegiance, as one commentator wrote, what this one commentator called this blight, this cancer. It meant that Irish land was producing, for the most part, as little as soil and climate will allow. By 1940, a government official was writing of appalling hardship and poverty and of agricultural slums. Now, to prepare for the post-war war world and to take on these slums, the government had instituted a radical reassessment of farming policy in all its guises. A government commission was established which produced a series of sectoral reports which were a damning indictment of the broad failures of Irish farmer, farming, both in its pattern and in its levels of production, and ended with a majority report which noted, the condition of many Irish farms is deplorable. The fertility of thousands of farms is now so low that they yield but the barest maintenance to their occupiers and frequently subsistence is obtained by annual lettings or by the repeated sale of hay or by part-time alternative employment. Judged by modern standards of agriculture, wrote the official, such land is essentially derelict. However, there remained a commitment to build Irish prosperity around farming in the post-war years. This is revealed in the trade agreement with the United Kingdom in 1948, where negotiations inevitably returned time and again to the price and quantity of live cattle that would be exported from Ireland. It was revealed also in the manner that Ireland chose to use its martial aid money. In 1950, the leader of Fine Gael, Richard Mulcahy, had said, and I quote, we have always accepted 
the supremacy of agriculture in the nation's economy. Emphasis has been given to this by our government's decision to do what no other government has undertaken, which is to invest almost the whole of the funds available to us in the rehabilitation of the land of the country. As a result of this investment in what became known as the Latin Land Re Rehabilitation Project, it was planned to increase agricultural output by 22% in four years after 1948. This was, uh, uh, sorry, after 1950. This was the investment which was intended to kickstart the Irish economy and bring prosperity through the 1950s. The plan was a failure. In the end, the increase in output across the 1950s was just 2.5%, while the volume of agricultural exports rose by just 0.5% during the 1950s. There were a range of reasons for this. There was a range of reasons for this, not least because the land habilitation project was entirely undercut by other aspects of government policy. The core ambition of this policy, of land distribution for example, remained to establish as many families on the land as possible. The problem with that was that the size of the small farms created by the state was so small, often 35 acres but never more than 50, as to render them not just incapable of expansion, but increasingly incapable even of survival. It is a salutary fact that after 1945, some 25,800 small farms were created by the Irish government. It would be a mistake to imagine that this small farms policy was something which was dreamed up by ideologues and imposed by the state on an unwilling Irish public. The cherished dream of many was to obtain the biggest farm possible. But the first goal was to achieve any sort of farm at all. You see this in the letters received by TDs through the 1950s. One woman, for example, wrote to the Limerick TD, Donegal Brian, to plead the case of her son, who she said was married with one child and currently farmed eight acres of craggy land, which you may understand is hard to make a living on. I wonder if you can do anything for him to get a few more acres. There is letter after letter after letter like this in the pages of Donegal Breen TD in the, in the UCD archives. Alongside farm size, the second reason for the failure of Irish agriculture was the want of ad adequate education. And this ties in with what, what Dahi was saying there. As late as 1964, 83% of Irish farmers had received only a primary school education. Every year, 7,000 farmers' sons who were expected to inherit the farm left the school to go into farming, left school to go into farming, but only 200 of that 7,000 received any instruction in agriculture. Back in the 1930s, there had been a proposal to establish 500 small agricultural instruction schools across the country with a view towards providing a level of agricultural education to those who were leaving national schools. This was rejected by the Irish Catholic bishops who wrote to the Department of Education to say that this was an unnecessary extension of state control into education. The bishops further stated that in many households, families were so poor that they needed the children to go to work and so they didn't have the resources to send them to such schools. And finally, the bishops wrote that from the moral point of view, there was an inherent danger in allowing boys and girls between the ages of 12 and 16 to travel unsupervised together on bicycles to school. In the wake of church objections, the government of the 1930s abandoned the plan and the education of Irish farmers remained basic. Ultimately though, even if Irish land policy had been appropriate and even if education standards had been excellent, what the Irish were trying to do flew straight into the face of the prevailing winds of the rest of the Western world, where workers were being freed from the land to provide labour for industrial development. This drift from the land had been something underway from the 19th century, but its momentum had accelerated significantly after World War II, facilitated in many places by increased mechanisation of farming. Across the world, in every modern society, farmers and especially small farmers were being pushed to the margins. As Eric Hobsbawm put it, 
the most dramatic and far-reaching social change of the second half of the 20th century and the one which cuts us forever off from the world of the past is the death of the peasantry. The policy of successive Irish governments was to try and resist that process and the result was complete failure. In short, there was a mass exodus from the countryside. In 1945, 522,000 men worked on southern Irish farms. 20 years later, in 1965, that 522,000 had fall fallen almost in half to just over 300,000. One byproduct of this was that in contrast to trends elsewhere in the world, the proportion of female farmers in the Republic of Ireland actually increased throughout the 20th century and reached 15.8% in 1951. Almost invariably, this was not by way of female empowerment or the ascension of economic independence. Rather, it was that women had been left in possession through the death and emigration of all male relatives. And so it was that 40% of those female farmers were over the age of 65. To conclude, the abandonment of the land by the people, the abandonment of the land by the children of small farmers was the most devastating of statements that the vision of a prosperous farming society had been entirely shattered. The South of Ireland was, as the Farmers' Journal had reported, a land half farmed, a people fleeing in despair. And in essence, the radical and the pragmatic had wrestled each other into a fatigue of stagnation in Ireland. And the result was not stability, it was exodus. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Paul Rouse. A fascinating exploration, I think, of of the land in this, and it kind of has echoes in my head, Paul. Of you know, we hear from current pol political leaders about the importance of housing, but yes, you know, successful failures, you know continue but yet yeah, there are echoes I think of what you were talking about there a fascinating discussion we'll get into it with some some very interesting questions already coming in again just remind you of the Slido app if you have any comments or queries our final speaker this afternoon is Professor Lindsay Erna Byrne who is Professor of Irish Gender History at the School of History at University College Cork she has researched and published widely on modern Irish history with a particular focus on poverty welfare gender sexuality health and vulnerable and marginalized groups she, most recently, she has co-authored A History of Ireland's Abortion Journey, and she has presented and co-wrote the documentary Forgotten Widows of the Revolution, which first aired on Orty in May of this year. Her paper is entitled Family and Vulnerability in the Irish Free State. Professor, you have the floor for 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction. I'd like to echo my other speakers' gratitude to Connor, who's up there in the corner, Connor Mulvaha, and Jenny Costello for organising this event, and also to the two signers, who I've just been in awe of watching, uh, rotating there, and I'll try not to make your job too difficult by speaking a little bit slower. Um, when contemporaries called upon the Irish family to reassert itself and help stabilise the country in the wake of the Civil War, they were evoking an idealised concept of the family as a moral institution that embodied respectable values. One that was constituted by marriage, headed by an able-bodied working man for the purposes of begetting obedient children who would, as Paul outlined, aspire to own land or property. The prolonged period of conflict and disruption involving so many young people, coupled with the loss of so many of those young people in the Great War, the prolonged period of conflict in Ireland itself, and the flu pandemic of 1918-1919, all heightened a general sense of anxiety about the social disruption and its impact on the family. In the Irish Free State, this was linked in complex ways with fears about the economic future of the new state, as, as Paul has outlined really well in his paper, and set the tone for the relationship between the state, its local arms of governance, and Irish families. However, while the Irish family, as an abstract ideological concept created as an agent for social stability, was there and very strong in much of this rhetoric, in the real world, there were but messy Irish families intimate human groupings subject to all the vagaries of humanity and the uncertainties of life. While we've done quite well at tracing and problematizing the ideology of the Irish family as a concept, the real challenge is in elucidating and understanding the relationship between that ideology 
and the lived experiences of flesh and blood families. Now, I don't claim to be able to do that in the next 15 minutes, but I do want to try and illustrate the potential the Irish Civil War and the archives that it has generated offer us to explore it. This is a period when the day-to-day -day relationship between the new state and family life was being redrawn in small yet profoundly significant ways in multiple, often hidden, bureaucratic processes. The archives generated by this bureaucracy from the Military Service Pensions Collection, which I know others have mentioned, to the 1920s Compensation Committee files, to innumerable uh, politicians' private papers, but also charitable records, obviously contain evidence of the trauma of conflict and the pain of loss. But they also document the mundane and manifold ways families got by and the way they negotiated the ideology that framed their existence and the deadly consequences when they failed, when the obstacles were just too much. These archives are sites of encounters between families and the state, but they're also sites of encounters between states, families and social values. I think the way in which we can witness those being shaped and honed and negotiated is where there's real potential for understanding exactly what kind of state was, was, was created. The process of deciding entitlement, for example, was in effect a proxy struggle over the social values of the new state, in which defending the idea of the right type of family was central. To quote Sidia Hartman, the archive is always inseparable from the play of power. And we as historians are so often reliant on the archives of the very institutions that defended the status quo, the legal, political and religious systems which policed and reinforced inequality. The archive is therefore neither passive nor is it dead. It continues to spin its narrative in everything we write, which is why it's essential that we build it into the work of our analysis. It can't be relegated merely to the footnotes and its sources mined for their content. If we seek to both understand the continued relevance of these power structures, but also to try and loosen their hold on us. Now, for the time I have left, I want to focus on the dependence files in the Military Service Pensions Collection. So, I want to start by thanking and, thanking and acknowledging the work of Cecile Gordon and Leanne Ledgewood on this archive, but I also want to uh, reference Marie Coleman's wonderful work, she's sitting at the back there, on the Pensions Act, because Marie was ahead of all of us in understanding, the under in understanding the importance of the pensions and that kind of process of negotiating in deciding who was of value and who wasn't in this new state. The Irish Army Pensions Act of 1923 was one of the first attempts by the Irish Free State to address the needs of those impacted directly by the Irish Revolution, spanning from 1916 through to the end of the Civil War. Section 2 of the Act covered extra pensions to married men, while Sections 7 and 8 provided for allowances for dependents of deceased officers and soldiers. While these dependents were most often widows and children, mothers, fathers and younger siblings of those killed in action also feature in this archive. And they tell us a lot about what both Paul and Mary have alluded to, Mary Daly earlier in the, in the day have alluded to, is the, the degree to which an entire family was involved in survival. The response to these claims was shaped by prevalent understandings of the relationship between gender and dependency, how those two things went together and what was the appropriate relationship between them. The 1923 Act itself is shaped by the idea of the male breadwinner and the differing notions of legitimate dependency, familial responsibility and morality, all inherent in this idea of that family model. In the bureaucratic, in the bureaucratic process of decision making, we can literally listen to these conversations about these individual families and their relationship to this idealised notion of the Irish family. In his 2013 study of British state formation, Patrick Joyce argues that the masculinization of power and the subordination of women was formative in the creation of what he called a ruling class mentality in Britain. And I think this understanding this mentality, the sort of a mentality that's emerging in the free state in bureaucratic centres in the 20s and 30s is really important. The military service pensions collection as one of the first welfare schemes designed and run by the new Irish state is in many senses an early performance of its statehood, allowing us to witness the shaping and honing of the Irish ruling class mentality through administration.
The archive is a microcosm of the gender and social landscape of the early 20th century. The dependence files, in the dependence files, it is ver invariably women appealing to an almost exclusively male cast of actors in the vouching and decision-making process. The voice of appeal is male, the voice of arbitration and decision, uh, sorry, the voice of appeal is female, and the voice of arbitration and decision, male. Mothers, wives and sisters make up our cast of ordinary voices, while priests, police and solicitors are the voices of authority, either validating the truth of these women's claims or deciding on whether their stories are, amount to what I would call qualifying narratives for the purposes of the Pensions Act. These are men comfortable, sometimes too comfortable, with reference numbers, sections, subsections and clauses who translate a largely female world of dependence into legal form. Without even a hint of irony, in 1924, the adjunct general requested the army finance officer to bring, and I quote him, his experienced mind to the question of who were the legitimate dependents in the case of a soldier whose mother and unmarried wife were both claiming compensation as his rightful dependents. Collectively, it took these experienced minds four years to decide, and ultimately, they came down on the narrowest possible interpretation of legitimate awarding the mother a gratuity and leaving his unmarried wife and two children to the chill winds of 1920s public relief and charity. Now, bureaucratic archives leech particular narratives from their protagonists, which have the effect of objectifying those subjects, rendering their subjecthood incidental to a determined process of inquiry. However, people found small and powerful ways to have their version registered even in the limited spaces allowed by officialdom. Mrs. Annie C of County Meath, for example, was clearly upset by the death of her husband and unconvinced that everything possible had been done to save his life by the army. Her husband, Christopher, had died of pneumonia in November 1922, only two months after joining the army. On her green pension application form, she noted his cause of death as the following, excessive strain, and overwork during service, and remaining on guard while ill, and being detained in military barracks for four days before being transferred to hospital. He had, she insisted, enjoyed good health, and hadn't to consult a doctor for three years preceding his death, thus implicitly challenging the army's version of his death, which was the following. Duty was strenuous, but it is thought that the weather and all other conditions were good. It appears deceased contracted a cold and was admitted to hospital in Navan, but succumbed to pneumonia. Annie C. had only been married eight years and had three children aged 13, 10 and 6. The local police report confirms she was completely dependent on her husband prior to his death and since then had been surviving on public assistance from the Meath Board of Guardians and the few shillings she made from washing. And Professor Mary Daly's paper earlier today will tell you what it might, was like to survive uh, on the Board of Guardians' assistance. Her husband had been less than two months in the army when he died. He was still, she was still writing, looking for a response in January 1925, when she proclaimed, I've written previous, previously to you, and I wish you can call at my home and see how matters really are. It's a very poor way to be treated by any government, especially with my chief and only support who was lost while defending it. I have no friends to give me any assistance and I see nothing before me and my small, nothing before me and my small family only hunger. While those applying for allowances, gratuities and pensions had to walk a really fine line between assertion and compliance, there were many ways people could register their frustration, disappointment and pain. In January 1923, Catherine Bree wrote to the army to express a mixture of these emotions following the death of her son. I've never received a notice of his being wounded or burial from the military authorities. Surely as my dead child has made the supreme sacrifice for Ireland, the least I might expect, expect is an acknowledgement of his death. On the 13th of October 1922, Catherine Bree's eldest son, Private James B, was shot in the stomach and wounded in County Kerry and died later that night in Abbeyfield Hospital. 
She wasn't notified of his death until months afterwards, meaning that she missed his funeral and all that that entailed in terms of coming to terms with her terrible loss. And I was struck during COVID how many more of us have an understanding of what that actually did in terms of compounding her initial trauma. She had been widowed 11 years previously, and when she was only 26, and James had been a key support to her as she attempted to raise three other children. While Catherine had managed to work prior to the death of her eldest son in a local laundry, grief had destroyed her health and she could no longer work. It's breaking my heart, she wrote. I had not the poor consolation of seeing him or burying him. She was unable to understand why the new state required so many forms from her and why, once she'd filled them out, there was still no word, still no acknowledgement. She wrote again in 1924, I've not received any pension yet, although I filled in papers, sent in certificates of death, also the Civic Guard of Rathfarnham sent in papers twice, and my poor Jim was 18 years of age. I was left a widow with four boys when he was seven years old, and he was the eldest. I had to work hard to rear them. Just as he was a help to me, he answered the call. And as he made the supreme sacrifice, I think I'm at least worth the courtesy of a reply from the army authorities. Now, the reasons for the delay in responding to Catherine B are instructive for this uh, tension between ideology and lived experience. It appears that the problem was Catherine had worked prior to the death of her son, so she couldn't be considered wholly dependent upon him. If she had done nothing before her son's death, her route to a pension would have been smoother, probably not any hastier because they were in general very slow, but she was one of those cases where she was damned if she did and damned if she didn't. However, despite bureaucracy's best attempts to shield its agents from the human impact of the decisions they made in, relate, in relation to the legitimacy of these claims, there was still repeated evidence of an understanding that grief often broke the living and that the state owed them something. This was one of those cases. Despite all the talk of being bound by legislation and rules, of having no discretion and of being beholden to the law, there were always choices. There was always a way. In fact, I would argue the subtleties of class and gender are in the difference of who did and didn't benefit from the doubt. In fairness to the army, it worked hard to build a case for Catherine B that would change the Department of Finance's mind. It had already three times rejected uh, her case, revealing that it was possible to think outside the weight of facts and consider the reality of emotion, the army explained. There's no dispute about the facts. It is, represented, it is represented that the circumstances of the boy's death, the mother's uncertainty to his fate for months, and the fact that she had not the consolation of being present at his funeral played on the applicant's mind to such an extent as to seriously affect her health and render her unable to continue employment. The boy, seeing that he was the eldest, would naturally be looked to by the mother for, princi for her principal support. The question is whether having regard to all these circumstances, including the circumstances of his death and burial, and the low financial position of his mother, you could reconsider the case. The Department of Finance relented, and the full gratuity was paid to Catherine. This archive, though, makes one wonder at the price demanded by the bureaucratic process. When new legislation was passed, and Catherine applied again for a pension in 1953, she had to redocument all her suffering again for another generation of bureaucrats. In this iteration of the process, she had to surrender what I think must have been one of the most precious documents she possessed. A letter written by the priest who gave her son the last rites as he lay dying on a road in Kerry. One of the last documents in Catherine's file is the original copy of that letter dated the 16th of December, 1922. It offers us a glimpse into the communal nature of grief in which each seemingly senseless death reminded everyone of the vulnerability of their own family. Father Harrington explained, though mortally wounded, I found James perfectly conscious on reaching him. He had little and no difficulty in making his confession. And after giving him absolution, I anointed him and gave him the last blessing. These two aspects, an indication of the centrality of these rites of passage for so many in 1920s Ireland, as Dohi so well elucidated, this was so, so important, such a gift that he gave her in recounting this. 
The priest did not spare James's loved one the truth, though, but he softened it by giving them a hero. He was naturally in great pain and said so in my asking him, he wrote, but you will be glad to learn he never complained or murmured whilst I was with him. God rest his soul. He was a dear good boy, one of the best I ever met, and I told the people so when denouncing the dastardly murder the following Sunday. On the pages of this letter, this priest was everything he should have been and reminds us of the central role many priests played in the lives of these vulnerable women. He understood completely what missing a son's funeral would do to any mother, and so he took her into his church to show her the tears wept for her son. He explained that he spoke with such conviction about James that Sunday that emotion quite overcame him, and many of those in the church were also in tears when I had finished. Tell his dear mother that she has reason to be proud of James, for he was an excellent boy, as well as a most lovable character. Of that I am sure, and I am also sure he is happy. He was quite resigned to die, and gladly forgave those who had so foully done him to death. The biblical overturns, over, overtones there, I think, are very clear. While she did secure a pension in exchange for this priceless family document, Catherine B. enjoyed it for less than three years before she herself died in 1956. When her son wrote to inform the army of her passing, he wondered could her pension continue to support her sister, with whom she had lived until her death. However, only days later, before the army had a chance to refuse this request, which it was going to do, he wrote back to say, don't bother, she too has died. To the very end, this case file underscored the female world of impoverished dependence created by the economic structures which informed legislations like the Pension Act. The world of grief and relentless financial struggle was overwhelmingly female, and this was no accident. It was the outcome of an economy informed by gendered ideology that offered women so few options and a state that enshrined this disadvantage in its legislation. In reality, female vulnerability was the inevitable result of this male breadwinner fiction, and it was a fiction. In many senses, this archive is the natural outcome of that model, which rendered women dependents while never releasing enough wealth to eliminate the necessity for mothers and their children to work. The cost of ingraining this logic in the welfare system of the new state tore families apart, consigned thousands others to emigration and their children to institutions, and killed people. This archive embodies the tension and alienation caused by totalizing bu bureaucracies and structural inequality. It reveals that the stabilizing environment of the 1920s could also be a profoundly reductionist one, in which any illusion of revolutionary solidarity evaporated in the banality of self-governance. While the institutional mindset was already programmed prior to 1922, its Irish incarnation provided little more comfort than its British predecessor for the most vulnerable in society. And to conclude, over the next few years, more and more researchers should and will interrogate this archive and many others, and we will be better able to construct the relationship between the fragment and the whole, the individual and the nation state. This offers us, I think, a chance of writing a history of modern Ireland that takes human agency seriously, reclaims the subjecthood of so many people effaced by structural inequality, and elucidates the power structures that continue to inform Ireland today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was a, another fascinating um, discussion and paper. And I suppose what we're trying to, going to do over the next 10 or 15 minutes or so is just kind of weave in together the themes that, we've, that, that have been raised here, to, I suppose to get a full sense of those very early days of, of, of the Irish Free State. Paul, I know you're, 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 you're tight on time, so there are a couple of questions here that I want to put to you first, if I, if I may. One is from Marie Coleman, uh, who's asked, could you comment on the significance of the VECs in providing some agricultural instruction at post-primary level prior, or, um, prior to, to 1970? And secondly, to what extent was farming know-how lessened by the removal in the 1920s of rural science from, uh, primary school, from the primary school curriculum to make room for compulsory Irish? That's from uh, Donald O'Brolochan. Um, there are two great questions and they're related questions. I think I'd look at it in the whole, uh, the number of students who went to VCs around the country 
they did in, it did increase through the decades, but it was limited in numbers at any given time. So it definitely had an impact. And if you want to look at the 200, many of the examples of people who did get instruction went through are of the 200 who were leaving every year were in VECs. But by but but that's the limit, I think, of what could be achieved in the in in the scale of 7,000 boys leaving school to take over farms in any given year. It was relatively speaking. Um, in, in significant in terms of rural science changing. I think there's a, there's a job work to be done, a greater study needed on what was happening to the education system in Ireland in the 20s and 30s, in which the idea of compulsory Ireland, Irish, it's kind of the stick which is used to beat every other failure of the system. And it doesn't seem to me to be enough of, uh, it certainly isn't enough of an explanation for the decisions that were made. Okay. Dahi, your discussion about the role of church and state, I mean, obviously it's dominated, you know, debate here for, for so many years and obviously the horrors that have come out in more recent times um, have, have, have sort of given credence to that. But I suppose one of the questions, I think Fiona Doris asked a very interesting question and she, she cast it in this light, that the confession box pub near the pro-cathedral was used by priests to give sacraments to those fighting during the Civil War. And she asked the question, did many priests defy the bishops in sort of supporting the rebels during the Civil War? Oh yes, they did, yeah. Um, it, it, it depended on what part of the country, if you were to look at, say, places like Mayo, um, the anti-treaty side are sustained in Mayo by the population, and that includes priests. However, I mean, a majority would have followed uh, their bishops and would have been in favour of um, stability and the provisional government of the Irish Free State, um, but certainly a, a number of priests uh, were Republican and very Republican. Lindsay, the, one of the issues that Dahi raised was that relationship, not only with leading politicians and bishops, but between higher civil servants um, within the permanent government. To what extent can you say, or can you assess, did that role have in that sort of paternalistic system, that sort of, that structural inequality that, that, you, that you spoke about in your, that in, in your paper? Like, can you assess what role that had, or, or was that relationship important to, to copper fasten that inequality? Oh, I think it was, yeah, I think it was very important. Um, because it, because Stoy said it offered both a rationale, but also comfort, it's quite good. And so it was very difficult for people to see the system they were trapped in. Mm. I've done a lot of work looking at the letters written to Archbishop Byrne by people from all over the country. And he was really, really good to them, you know, on an individual level, very kind. But, but there, was, there was just such a bind that people were caught in. They would be helped for a certain amount of time because that the idea that you needed to be self-sufficient and get back up on your feet in an economic structure where that was just not possible, particularly for female do dominated households. It was mm. never going to be possible. So the, the poor were constantly being caught between these kind of demands placed on them and having to negotiate these. But they believed profoundly, they got a lot of comfort from their faith and relationships with their priests. And you do find lots of priests on an individual level really advocating for women. Um, and they must have written thousands of letters for them. I mean, that was a huge part of the job that they did. As Paul alluded to, the archives are full of, of, of letters of survival, people firing letters off to all these different um, sources, potential sources of help. And in terms of the actual, the, the history of the free state, I mean, as someone who's like my area of interest is that, 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 that those early stages of the free state. But, you know, my studies have told me it was a history of men, written by men, for men, essentially, that the, the story of the women of Ireland has only really become to the fore because of the military archives, and especially in more recent times. How much like, or how likely is it, is that, I suppose, the understand or the established narrative likely to change with all this new information coming to light? Oh, I think, I think it will change on lots of, for lots of reasons, um, because it isn't just that those archives are raising female voices, they're also allowing us to see how things actually worked out on the ground. Mm. So how did theory actually play out and, and to what degree? Because I, I, I made an off the cuff remark in the paper about the fact that <coughs> subtleties of gender and class were often in who got the benefit of the doubt. Mm. And that's very difficult for us to see unless we have a you know, really large volume of archival material, we can actually start, and that's I think what's happening at the moment. So it's, it's about, it isn't, I mean, there's been a lot of work done on women's history since the 80s, but I think what you're getting now are, are, are voices are, that are really kind of on the, on the kind of lowest level in terms of power mm. that we're finding, and we're starting to be able to see patterns, but also patterns between the ways in which these bureaucracies worked and how they were also self-limiting. So that I think that's really to try and understand 
around the Irish mentality. I mean, Martin McGuire's done some really interesting work on the civil service, but the, that, that, that mentality of ruling, to what degree was that taken from the erstwhile colonizers? And to what degree was it then kind of reshaped by Catholicism and other dominant pressures? And then how did, how did it over time, and you can see that with pension archives that mm. last until the 50s, over time, how did that change over the generations? Dahi, um, there's a very interesting question here from Patrick Kilfeather. He said, did the irregulars who were Roman Catholics, who were executed by the Free State Army, receive absolution from all of their sins, i.e. essentially fighting against the state? That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I see two historians there in the back row who might know more about this than I do. I think in some cases, yes, they do, and in other cases, they don't. Um, and you have a number of, uh, you have a number of letters uh, to Archbishop Byrne, for example, um, from families where they're giving out that um, their loved ones who are in Mount Joy are not are being denied the, the sacraments. But uh, I mean, in many respects, some priests take a very black and white view on it, uh, that people have contravened the commandments, therefore they're denied the sacraments. But I think a lot of priests are compassionate as well in terms of understanding the need um, for those who are about to face execution to have, mm. uh, to have the final um, blessing. There's w another question here now, it's, it, it's unnamed, but is it really fair to say that the Catholic state within a state in inverted commoners was unhealthy, given its huge contribution to education, health, and so much more in Irish life? Um, I suppose what I meant by unhealthy was the idea that it was largely unchecked, um, that um, it, development in, in, in all sorts of areas, health and education, was arguably held back um, mm -hmm. because there was no interrogation. Is, is the system working? Um, is it benefiting Irish citizens? Um, but of course, of course, I mean, as, as Professor Mary Daly uh, explained this morning, um, Ireland was not any different from other countries where responsibility for education and health and welfare was lumped on, um, on, on churches and, um, uh, and charities before the Second World War. So we're just conforming with what's going on everywhere else. And of course, all of those people who are writing letters uh, that Lindsay has wonderfully illustrated in, in, in her paper, they're writing letters because literacy is so strong. It's strong because the school system that had been established in the 19th century uh, is at a parish level and spans the entire country. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I'm not at all trying to say that the work done by the church was um, was uh, inadequate. What I'm what I'm questioning really is just the lack of state oversight, oversight. of what are effectively state functions. Exactly. And Lindsay, to to that point. Um, I mean, the treatment of women and marginal groups in Ireland in those early years of the Free State, were they out of step with the treatment of women and marginal groups in other countries or in Western Europe, or were we largely kind of in step? Because obviously it's a very, it's, I won't say upsetting, but I mean, it's a very, like, the treatment yes and of women no. and marginal groups. I'll answer it. Yes okay. and no. Yes and no. Um, <coughs> I mean, there were, there were, there were broad trends uh, that were, so the whole breadwinner model is a kind of Western European, mm. but within all, within all cultural settings, there are modifications and certain values imposed by the native dispensation. So there's obviously ways in which we're subtly different. Where, 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 where Ireland definitely starts to deviate is by the 30s when you have in, in, in most countries in Europe an understanding, for example, of the need to control fertility mm. because of the impact it has on female health, but also poverty rates. And that's where you start to see you know, a real divergence. But in a lot of things, even like the jury acts and the things that Mary McAuliffe was saying, this similar, similar incursions are happening in Britain at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there's, a, there's a much more accessible divorce by the end of the 30s in Britain. So there's, there are definite, you know, Ireland really starts to fall behind within, by the end of that decade in the 1930s. Um, and to, to just pick up on that anonymous question, I think it was abusive. Yes, it was abusive. The church's control and power was abusive. I, don't, I think that is beyond question now. I think that has been established. When you give any structure such complete power, that's mm. what you get. So I, I would answer that much more, you know, I'm sorry, but we, we, that, that argument, surely that argument has been won. Okay, and unfortunately, the, that we have most of the questions, if not all of the questions that have been sent in have been answered. And um, the timekeepers here have told me that we are actually now out of time. So I would ask you all to please give a round of applause to our speakers here this afternoon. <laughs> You'll be, you'll be pleased to know that teas and coffees are now being served outside. The next panel will begin at 4.15. Before we go, I just want to say on my own behalf, a big thank you to Connor and to Jenny for organising the conference here this afternoon. And thank you all very much for your time and your attendance here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome to this, the final uh, session of this con conference. Um, I know that during the course of yesterday and today, there have been lots of very stimulating contributions, and I can see even some of the themes from the last session are, are likely to pop up again. We are reflecting on a century of statehood. So we have uh, just under an hour to do 100 years of Irish history, so there's no pressure at all. But we do have a fabulous panel uh, to discuss those things. Beside me, Professor Marie Coleman, Professor of 20th Century Irish History in Queen's University in Belfast. Beside her, Professor Dermot Ferreter, Chair of Modern Irish History at the UCD School of History. And uh, on the far right there, Professor Emeritus at the European University Institute, Bridget Laffin. I'm sure you're all very familiar with three very fine historians historians uh, and we are going to try and keep to time because uh, Connor Mulva has already given me my writing instructions and I'll be in terrible trouble if we go over. And just to remind you all, there is the, uh, the facility for questions and answers um, on the Slido uh, app. I think you're probably at this stage all very familiar with it. So let's jump in and I'll start with you, Marie. How long do you, how many minutes do, does Connor allow us? He, he allows us. Well, we're, we're talking up until quarter past four, but right. we're just, we're just, few, having, few, few we're just having a chat, so you right. don't need to get it all in. That's first, fine. Uh, um, well, I did have some ideas, and then, as with all good conferences, I came here, and the chat was so good, it gave me lots of other ideas. Um, the first point I was going to make and is that I, this the whole theme of this conference has been state building, but I would argue that we need to start re-looking at how the Irish built their state in the context of being a post-conflict society. And I think that uh, lens is, is only starting to emerge. People like Anne Dolan have looked ahead. And it, of course, being based in Belfast, it's a theme I am very familiar with. We, we still live in one of those, it seems. But I, I think that methodology and that uh, perspective on what's happening in the Irish Free State in the 1920s, and I would say even up until the 1930s, it is a post-conflict society. To link in, as you said, we'll have a lot of links here with yeah. the previous section, to link with Lindsay's paper on the pensions, I don't think you can understand the uh, rationale for the introduction of many of those pensions, particularly the service ones, the disability ones, and the ones for um, people who lost family in the state, that, that, that's slightly different, but the service pensions, they are entirely brought in as a means for the Irish Free State to keep their own people on side after the army mutiny of 1924. And I'm putting in a bid here for another conference next year. Decade of centenaries isn't over. We still have the army, the, the, the army mutiny. We can exactly. Keep, keep well, we can go up to the bicentenary of Catholic emancipation so and then is, keep going. this is bribery mm -hmm. by the state. That is exactly what it is. Uh, once the army mutiny comes along, the, in any post-conflict situation, what we would now recognise as the UN coming in and it, putting in programmes for DDR, disarmament, demobilisation and reintegration, the Irish Free State has to disarm, demobilise and reintegrate its own army. 1924, they realise we have spent 10 years telling these guys to use guns and now we want them to stop using guns, so this is one way to stop them doing it. Okay, well, Dermot, maybe pick up on that. So the, the Free State has to bribe its own uh, people to keep them on side, but there's also that huge chunk on the other side, the Republicans, who don't recognise the legitimacy of the new state. Yeah, a lot of it is linked to a theme that people have come back to repeatedly over the last two days, this gulf between the, the dream and the reality. Uh, Orla Feely mentioned yesterday, Patrick Carroll, talking about imagining but then having to build um, and a lot of the revolutionary veterans reflected on that at a later stage in life including Dennis McCullough and he spoke as an older man about the Ireland that we had dreamt of you know um, Good La Valera didn't have uh, a monopoly on that, on that idea of the Ireland we, we dreamt of um, and he said that we lived in dreams always um, and he had dreamt of the Irish people as a free people, as a Gaelic people. Um, and he ended up witnessing an Ireland that was very different from the dream. But he did say not that we were wrong in any of this. And I think it's important that we acknowledge it's not for us to take away those dreams from them or to be dismissive or condescending about them. Um, that idealism was very deeply felt. The reality, of course, of, of state building throws up all sorts of, of new challenges. Part of it is about trying to frame a narrative. 
We have an awful lot of contrived and false dichotomies in relation to the contested state. Um, we have, for example, Kevin O'Higgins gave a very interesting address to the Oxford Union in 1924, and part of it was about fashioning a narrative for the pro-treaty side, and he conjured up that very memorable image of, of eight young men in City Hall standing amidst the ruins of one administration with the foundations of another not yet built, and wild men screaming through the keyhole. Mm. And that was a way, obviously, of delegitimizing uh, those who have, were referred to as the irregulars. And that was a piece of propaganda, but it was also... Uh, another part of that speech was when he referred to the, the composite that a revolution can throw up. There's idealism and there's megalomania and there's criminality. Um, and it's, it's that combination that is, is very complicated uh, in the 1920s in particular. And we have been focusing a lot on 1922, but we also need to think about 1932, because that's a very important moment as well. Mm. And when we talk about some of the milestones of, of state building, we'd often refer to the 1937 Constitution. That wasn't just about reflecting um, the, the values that had been established since 1932 or since the change of power, uh, the peaceful change, change of power, which was significant. It was really about the values that had been established in, in, in previous decades uh, since the foundation of the state. Uh, so there is a degree of, of continuity. But what I would often say to students is, can we avoid the balance sheet approach it's very easy for us to say, well, we succeeded in doing this and we failed miserably in relation to that. That's what we're getting much more of, I think, in, relate, in relation to characterising the century is what it felt like. Mm. We didn't get much of that when we were students. We tended to get narratives of high politics, which I hope don't go out of fashion because they're very important. Mm. Um, but we didn't get much on, on what it felt like. A lot of the archival material that's been referred to now is giving us much more of a sense of that. Bridget, I might bring you in there um, because, I mean, it's, it's been touched on uh, here and it was touched on in, in, in the earlier session about, you know, 6th of December 1922, an independent Irish state comes into being. So the, whole, the Holy Land has been reached in a sense, but it's a limited sovereignty because of the terms of the treaty. Obviously, partition means it doesn't extend to the entire island. And obviously, you have the treaty split and, and all the the waste of life and, and, and the uh, cutting off of unity that that entails. So the promised land has been reached. It was inevitable in those circumstances that there was going to be disappointment. Uh, uh, absolutely. But I think one of the things we should think about is would those who uh, convened for the first Dáil in 1919, would they take the Ireland we now have? I think broadly they probably would. With all of the issues around the partition of the island, the double majority, double minority problem that we face on this island, no matter how you cut it ge uh, geographically. I'm very struck that, and I'm not a historian, I'm a political scientist, so I tend to work in the more in the present, but I'm very struck that we didn't hear much about how that Ireland was a small state. And small states suffer from particular vulnerabilities, it, depending on the fit between them and the world out there uh, and how they navigate geopolitics, geoeconomics. And states, small states tend to have two ways of doing this. One is that you try to have a good fit between the world out there, the global political economy, geopolitics and your domestic policies. And we heard very strongly that there, that gap was there. There was a there was a gap in Ireland between the desire for prosperity, prosperity through small farms and the world out there as the world was drifting, uh, labour was drifting into cities. So that was, there was a huge disjuncture there between that. A particular just disjuncture in the post-war period, for, 48 into the end of the 1950s, where the world was liberalising economically and Ireland was not. So that fit, how to get that fit right. And then the other is that small states tend to look for shelter. So where, are, where, is, where do you find shelter? And unfortunately for Ireland, in terms of the shelter we found was the asymmetric relationship, continuing asymmetry, asymmetric relationship with the UK. And that was very problematic to us. And then after the Second World War, we didn't join NATO, we didn't have to. But if Ireland had been located geographically in the North Sea, we would have had a very different security decision to take. And it was EU membership in 73 that gave us the dual economic shelter and a lot followed from there. So I do think that we need to also think with all the contestation and the dreams 
Ireland developed under pretty tough circumstances, a lot of state capacity in, the inter in, in that hundred years, albeit with all of the, with all of the uh, unfinished business and the problems that we still have as a so society. But this is, sometimes in, in, in Ireland you get almost a failed state analysis of the Irish state and that in my view is just bonkers. And yes, it did take us, Marie, it did take us a long time to get to where we are now. And um, a lot of people would say that perhaps had different choices been taken at different times. And it's interesting, what Bridget says is absolutely right. In 1932, when de Valera was pursuing protection, that was the international norm. That's what everybody was doing. I think you're on. I'm interested. You mentioned 32 and um, Dermot, of course, uh, focused on it. And I think, again, 32 is uh, hugely significant. It's the peace, that peaceful trans handover of power in 32 is hugely important. Um, I think that the small state issue and the, uh, like I said, the capacity building, we do have to look a bit at the old British legacy. Um, I think uh, uh, Bill Kassan's work on why the free state stayed democratic throughout the 20s and the 30s when all around it, all those other successor states and many of them small states were falling to fascism. Uh, and there were, in spite of the com a complex relationship with Britain, as you said, there's the, 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 they shield us in times of the Second World War. Um, at the same time, we have a very... Um, problematic relationship as Paul Rouse showed, but uh, I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the good parts of the British legacy in building the new state. Things like, like our bureaucracy, yes we built up a new Irish civil service, but it was on the basis of a British style. So I think not losing sight of maybe the good parts of the British legacy, which enabled us to the state to hit the ground running in 22, maybe slash a bit of green on the post boxes and <laughs> stamp over the king's head on the stamps. Yeah. But there was a, there there, was there was a structure there. there. Okay. Well, that, and that, not, what what the, did the Romans ever do for us? The British civil legacy service. wasn't all yeah, bad. That civil service continuity, and indeed the success of the civil service is, is a crucial point. And we can quote politicians, of course, but we do need to be conscious of those who were not public figures in that sense. People like JJ McGilligan, who've become extraordinarily powerful civil servants, the, the boss of the Department of Finance. The Department of Finance becomes extraordinarily uh, powerful. And it partly has to do, of course, with continuity, but also with the vacuum that's there uh, as a result of the Civil War. And who is in a position to fashion policy and to lead uh, discussions about policy and, and to impose their ideas when politicians are understandably distracted, particularly during, during civil war. And there's a tendency on the part of too many historians now, I think, to see bureaucracy as the enemy. And one of the reasons we have such extensive archival material is partly because the bureaucrats were so meticulous and assiduous in how they did their jobs. Um, so it's important to remember that. But there is also that culture which is a very centralised political culture that comes out yep. of the Civil War as well, which has affected us to this day. Um, that's also a continuity, because Britain is a very centralised political culture as well, but it's quite different to how power is distributed uh, in other entities. Um, and, you know, we saw a focus on, during the conference on local government and, you know, the absence of, of, of meaningful local government uh, in many ways. So there are a lot of, of, of legacies like that in relation to how power was handled, how it was distributed. But there are also those who are canny enough to know uh, that they need that continuity. Decisions that were made, for example, with the transfer of power in 1932 uh, about civil servants being kept in key positions, regardless of their political loyalties mm. when they were known, uh, that there was a pragmatic recognition uh, that you needed that skill and, and, and to build up that. And I would also, I would just add to that the diplomatic corps, the diplomatic service. Um, there was a lot of ingenuity and skill. And, you know, we heard elements of that yesterday, the fascination that existed too with how this infant small state would manage its affairs internationally. Uh, Bridges, just talk to us a bit about, that, about political culture. How much did we inherit from Britain? Because if you look at the party system, everybody famously says, well, it doesn't match anywhere in the world. 
So I, I would say we, 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 we learned how to run parliaments, that that mm. was the, 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 the presence in, in, in the mother of parliaments of Irish representatives meant that when the state was established, there were people who understood and valued parliamentary democracy. And so th that, that matters a lot. I think the civil service culture. I think there's another feature of the Irish state that we more work should be done on, and that's you mentioned the diplomatic service, but it's not just the diplomatic service, but I would say the external facing Irish state. So IDA, uh, Enterprise Ireland, Chorus Throctola when it existed, NTMA, the money people, they were very, in terms of international comparators, were very, very good. And so we have to ask ourselves, what, how is it that that external facing state is very strong and has a lot of capacity. And for example, Brexit, the, the way in which the Irish state, both political and administrative, handled the Brexit negotiations is a test case, it, it's textbook in small state diplomacy. Between, it, between, uh, between when the British uh, decided to leave in, in June 16 to the opening of negotiations less than a year later, the Irish had held 240 meetings across the world on Brexit, P politicians and civil servants. At the same time, they ran uh, for a Security Council seat. Mm -hmm. And that's a tiny, tiny diplomatic service. But I don't want to say it's just foreign affairs because it's all those parts of the state that face out. Then why is it that the parts of the state that face in, other than I would say the best in class, the revenue commissioners, the modernization of the revenue commission is, uh, commissioners is another important s state capacity uh, development in, in this country. But why is it when it comes to the service state, health, housing, why, are we, why do we find these problems impossible or very difficult, and yet the external facing state is very strong. And I think there's a paradox there, and we need to understand more why that is the case. Just before we move on, Maria, and we, we have a couple of questions coming in that, that I want to put uh, to the panel. But before we do, while the state has been built up in the 26 counties, there is another uh, uh, jurisdiction, jurisdiction um, uh, where, where an administration, a government has been, uh, not a state, but a regional parliament has been built up. And, and you know, sometimes the narrative here doesn't, doesn't take a sufficient uh, cognizance of that. Well, you're taking me back to 31 years to one of my first tutorials in UCD with Mary Daly when we wrote <laughs> an essay for her. And she looked at us and the first thing she said is, you all write history with the partition, partitionist mentality. <laughs> Um, so I, and, yeah, and I was glad to see on the programme my colleague Margaret O'Callaghan, I wasn't able to get to her paper yesterday, but I think the, while this conference is, uh, re, it focuses on the, largely on the 26 counties, the, the, northern, we, we, the, the, the northern aspect was taken in there. Um, and, and I think it, it, the uh, Brexit's a very good example of what you're saying about the, how well the Irish were prepared. The British weren't prepared, as prepared to leave themselves as the Irish were for the impact on them of Britain leaving. And I think even it, it, it's not that bit of uh, the Irish yeah, he's, isn't even understood in Northern Ireland or in Britain. I think that they, they were looking on quite in awe at how well the Irish handled it. Uh, I think the, um, the relations between the two islands have converged so much within those um, uh, within the hundred years, but it's hard. Uh, it's hard to think of the two states as being anything other than partition, allowing the tyranny of the majority in both uh, and the jurisdictions. Carnival of reaction, as, uh, uh, as yes. Connolly predicted. Yeah, yeah, but we do need to give the situation the open-ended future that it had one hundred years ago. I think that's one of the points that Margaret would have made because she has elaborated on that theme before. Partition wasn't seen as permanent. The border wasn't seen as permanent. James Craig met Michael Collins in 1922. He got on better with him than he got on with Eamon de Valera, um, who tended to give him lectures um, on, on history. Uh, Collins was perhaps more pragmatic, but after he met Collins in 1922, James Craig went back to his cabinet um, and said, Perhaps in 50 years, perhaps in uh, 75 years, you know, we can review this situation. I'm not ruling out uh, further, closer cooperation between North and South. But of course, the Civil War in many ways uh, cements uh, the border. And then what's often forgotten, even in 1923, you know, the imposition of, of economic uh, 
uh, barriers between north and south uh, further cements it. But it wasn't, you know, inevitable uh, the way it developed, and we have to be conscious of that. But it's the extent to which there, the, the events of the years that we're looking at, the early 1920s, really emboldened that sense of, of sitting on what you have. And Craig was talking about cooperation, more cooperation, not a united Ireland. No, he wasn't talking about a united Ireland, but no. he was leaving the door open to the possibility of, you know, greater cooperation. Yeah. Uh, you know, we weren't just talking about uh, uh, tourism or electricity as it later became. Yeah. But it's also important to acknowledge just how betrayed Northern nationalists felt. Um, and, you know, there's that line that is, that, that's used uh, in relation to the, the Boundary Commission a couple of years later, uh, Care Healy, as you know, the, the former Sinn Féin for MANA MP, we've been sold into political servitude for all time. That sense of finality and, and permanence and abandonment, that has profound uh, political and, and psychological consequences that again are relevant to this day. Uh, well, speaking of this day, uh, Bridget, there's been a lot of talk recently about, you know, 100 years on, time for border poll, all that sort of thing. And I, I'm just struck, I'm, I'm reading the, the new uh, volume of documents of Irish foreign policy, late 1960s, and the officials in Dublin are saying, well, you know, the Stormont might agree to more cooperation, as, as Dermot was just talking about, but we won't let on our ulterior motive, which is that cooperation will inevitably lead to unity. Um, so there, there seems to be uh, there seems to be a different attitude in Dublin to in Belfast about what uh, cooperation would mean. So I I, I think the the future of the island is still very open. We have no idea what another hundred years looks like, what fifty year, what fifty years looks like. I think that the rapprochement in the mid nineteen sixties, Lamas's trip, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that potentially unleashed an incremental strengthening of relations north-south. But then, of course, the civil rights movement, mm. the repression, and the re-emergence of violence on the island of Ireland, that blew all of that out of the water. And it meant that the Irish state then had to, the Dublin government then had to try to insert itself because it had ignored broadly what was happening north of the border, to reinsert itself into the politics of the island again, the two parts of the island again, against very, very strong British opposition at the UN. I mean, when Paddy Hillary went to the UN, he was basically, he had to fight his way to, to make sure that they could even do anything about what was happening in the north or make any reference to it. But gradually, London understood that it, there was no way of addressing the violence in the north without bringing Dublin in. And then we had that very long period culminating in the Good Friday Agreement. But what, what Brexit has done to all of this is it has disturbed territorial politics in the UK and between the two parts of the island. And even though I know there is a poll this morning that shows that support for a unification, uh, there, a border poll would not succeed in the north at this stage. I think that's very, very open. I think that what happens in Northern Ireland will be determined by that middle group who, who no longer identify as nationalist or unionist. And I would say the future is much more open because of Brexit than it would have been without. Do you agree, Marie? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If I was a unionist, I would not be remotely um, happy. I'd have looked at the headline on a certain newspaper this morning going, oh, goody. Then I'd have looked at the figures and I'd had a good gulp and coughed up my morning coffee when I saw that only 50% would definitely stay in the union. And having lived through it, the change came in. 2016. We mm. weren't having these discussions, or if we had, we were having them, we were having them as completely academic discussions in my tutorials in Queen's about <laughs> could Ireland be unified. Suddenly it is an issue and it has come since June 2016. Okay. Yeah. Um, I might uh, go through some of these questions. So, uh, anonymous one. Did the long period which the revolutionary generation spent in power handicap national development, say, after 1945? Dear. To a degree it did. Um, it's very hard to measure that, and we have to acknowledge the uh, continual return <laughs> of the revolutionary uh, generation by the Irish electorate. Um, you know, I, th there'd be a broad enough consensus that Javelera perhaps stayed too long. Uh, Sean Amas was certainly in a hurry uh, 
between 1959 and 1966. Uh, that the way Whitaker put it, he loved taking decisions. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he had, he, he had been waiting, but at the same time, you know, th there was no great swell of opinion um, mm. for, for De Valera to, to leave the stage, as you well know. And Lamas um, was, one, was one of that generation. And, and I was just going to say, you know, L L we often think of Lamas as a different generation. Of course, he wasn't. I mean, one of the reasons why he departed in 1966, as, as he said himself, it was time for, uh, for a younger generation, not the 1916 uh, generation. Um, they did, of course, have vast experience uh, by the 1950s and the 1960s, and that did contribute to continuity. One of the interesting things, I suppose, around the, the period of, of the emergency, which was a significant challenge, um, nobody knew in 1939 how long that emergency was going to last, and you had consensus between both sides of the revolutionary generation broadly uh, about the importance of neutrality. Uh, I think that helped as well, that there was that continuity, that there was that uh, degree of continuity. But, you know, w when, when you look at what the alternative suggestions, what alternative suggestions were there uh, during the period we're talking about, uh, there wasn't a blueprint for a completely different approach being offered. Uh, well, that sort of touches on a question John Fitzgerald has put in, uh, which is the Second World War played a significant role in reuniting Finland uh, after its own civil war, I presume. Did the experience of the war play any similar role in Ireland? Bridget, I, I think, as, as Dermot says, it, it, there certainly was a unity. I, I, I think it... So, how, how to read Irish neutrality in the Second World War? I read it as an act of sovereignty. It was the first war that the Britain was involved in that we had a choice about. So it was a decisive act of sovereignty and in that sense. But of course, our neutrality was maintained largely because of partition, because the Allied forces had access to Loxwilly and Belfast. And so I'm, I wonder what would have, a hypothetical question, Ireland, a united Ireland had become independent in 1922. Would the British have allowed us be neutral? in the Second World War? I wonder, because yes. obviously the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic uh, passage was really important. So, I, it, it, yes, it unified internally, but then it, it also it really, it, it emphasised partition yeah. as well. Well, Winston Churchill said to Attlee yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, at an early stage in the war, we have to save the Irish from themselves. Um, yeah. But as would have been pointed out to him, uh, it wasn't Winston's decision. <laughs> exactly. Indeed. Um, okay, here's another uh, question. To what extent did investment in housing between 1920 and 1960 curtail improvements in or access to second and third level education, health system, social welfare? So I think the question is, did we spend too much money on housing? There's a controversial one for today, Marie. <laughs> I suppose there, there was a small pot, and I, I'll actually take up the healthcare side of it because uh, basically the Irish state wasn't funding healthcare in this period. It was uh, people who gambled and bought Irish sweepstake tickets first in Britain and then among the Irish diaspora in America up until the 1950s when Noel Brown decided that he would finally make the hospitals a charge on the state. So maybe some of the issues we're having with um, uh, issues about our, our, our failure in of the internal state goes back to the fact that for too long the state it, it was hands off and some that was somebody else's problem so i, I think that it, i i don't think it works i don't think it was that the money was there for everyone mm. so i think that maybe there were too many vested interests it's, it's and the funny. state had its, it's uh, yeah the vested it interests its, are his ideological important. yeah i mean if you and it's not just on the catholic side i will say this from doing the no. hospitals i know we talked about uh, and lindsay talked about the role of the catholic church and dahi did as well the church of ireland leaders were as adamant that they would take control uh, they would retain control of the adelaide and this went on up until the um uh, for even when tala hospital was being opened in the late 20th century it was as important for them to retain their control of their institutions and the, the Protestant voluntary hospitals went to the state and said yes we'll take that money thank you from the sweepstakes oh, oh no you can't have any role in saying how we spend it so it just this is, is an ideological thing in the Irish state it is not just to preserve Catholicism. I, I also think that that it took the Irish state a long time to do stuff that other states had done more quickly and earlier in Europe so on on education our investment came end 
end of the 1960s, towards the end of the 1960s, but then it was very significant investment. And one of the untold stories of that investment was the regional technical colleges, which were, they were kept at sub-degree level because the European Social Fund paid for courses that were sub-degree level. And it was as simple as that, just don't let them have degrees because then you get European money. But that investment was really mattered. I think the other area that, it, given, I mean, listening to, the, uh, to Mary this morning on, on the, the lack of a welfare system and the, the pensions, I mean, it's heartbreaking, the, the, the poverty and humiliation endured. But one of the things that did happen as our Ireland got richer, particularly from the early 90s onwards, is Ireland began to invest in a in its social protection system. And one of the reasons why we dealt with the Troika better than Italy, Greece and Spain is because our welfare system was stronger. It's incohate, it's very haphazard, but there was a real welfare system developed from the 1990s onwards that really mattered when austerity hit, it gave a buffer. There was a buffer in the society that, that helped. That doesn't mean that not, there couldn't be much uh, more done in, in the Irish welfare system. But where, again, I would like us to think about why is it that on the services side of the social state, we're still very patchy. If you're disabled in Ireland, if you need special needs in Ireland, if you need... Uh, we've islands of excellence. How is it that our cancer treatment improved dramatically mm. and other parts of our health system did not. So these are the kinds, it's that what I would call it lumpiness mm. or islands of excellence. But that's partly what's frozen in 1922. And Riley yesterday, the Finnish ambassador, referred to there being a social basis when it came to the Finnish divisions. And when you look at the debates that were going on about what the state needed to do in relation to the, the rights of its citizens um, and the welfare of its citizens, it's a different kind of debate. That debate isn't going on here to the same extent. But the housing question is interesting in that we have to go back to the 19th century. We have to think about the initiatives um, sponsored by the British government in the late 19th century in relation to social housing, what we would call social housing. Um, and there was actually, uh, there were a lot of assertions in the 30s, sometimes in the 20s and even beyond, that housing was a Christian obligation as well as a social and political obligation. And it wasn't unusual for, with the inter-party government that came to power in 1948, for both Labour and Fine Gael to be sharing platforms in relation to the importance of a housing drive and the state leading mm. that housing drive. And we've got a version of it in the 1970s as well. Social housing ultimately became privatised. Um, and, you know, th th there are particular reasons from that for, uh, for, from the 1980s onwards. But we don't have that same sense of vigorous debate about the resources of this state uh, in, in relation to welfare, partly I would argue as a result of what this conference is, is centred around, those uh, foundational years and the diversion into other areas, including of course the, uh, the cost of the civil war, the recovery uh, from the civil war. Yeah, but in comparison to Finland's civil war, I mean, the, the cost both in terms of lives lost and, and monetary terms was, was relatively small, wasn't it? But I, I think we have to, I mean, when we talk of Finland, we're setting a very high bar because mm, yeah. among the most successful small states in the world are the Nordics. <laughs> they, they hit all the, yeah. you know, the, the social provision, but they pay their taxes. It's, the, it's very different. I think what, what's interesting about Ireland is that we come from this Anglo-Saxon minimalist state tradition. And yet the state is, the Irish state actually is, is, is not a minimalist state. Yeah. Mm. So we have found our own way to a combination of... Berlin of, rather than Boston. But, the, but, but of, in the absence of women from, from policy discussion and from absolutely. politics, mm -hmm. uh, isn't that relevant here as well? Yes. I mean, we were told yesterday that 47% of the Finnish MPs uh, are women, that yep. they had full political rights from 1906. And I agree with you, you know, they are the exception. Uh, and it's not about us saying, well, why couldn't we be more like the Nordic countries? Mm. But you do have to consider uh, the implications. There were only two... Uh, female TDs 100 years ago, and of course both of them were, uh, were anti-treaty. Um, so that's how we started off. Uh, that did impact, I, I, I think you could argue, uh, on uh, 
certain policy areas as well that were not pushed to the extent that they might have been. But, but even in contemporary Ireland, childcare, mm. it's a disgrace, childcare in this state. It is. It's completely privatised and it's really expensive. And if women had been making decisions uh, it would, uh, in, in, in areas... We'd have more maternelle. <laughs> um, there's two questions about 1932, and we were talking about mm -hmm. kind of the importance of that. Uh, Dermot asks about the importance of army loyalty to the new government in 1932. Mm -hmm. And Donal O'Brolcon, um, 1932, isn't that when Fianna Fáil and Lamas applied Griffith's Sinn Féin economic policies building on the experience of success of the state capitalist Shannon ESB? So Cosgrave's government mm -hmm. um, does get credit for... Our to crush and, and rightly so, but obviously it was built on it. So 1932 again. I think the army thing still goes back to 1924. The, the importance of the army coming under civilian control, the appointment of Peter Hughes as the civilian minister for defence. Uh, so from that point, I think regardless of who is in government, the army is subservient to the civil authority. And that's why 1924 is so important. But possibly had it not happened that way, then maybe that question would have emerged in 32, but uh, it doesn't to the same extent because they've already solved that one. Um, I wasn't quite sure the, the, the Donald's question. Well, Donald is, is ba basically Sinn Féin adopting Griffith's, uh, Fianna Fáil adopting uh, Griffith's Sinn Féin policy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, self-sufficiency and so on. Yeah, I think as Dermot was saying, it's not, again, uh, and it's, it has come out in this conference, we shouldn't always think about Ireland as being completely exceptional internationally in those standard, uh, in those times. And uh, I don't think it was, it, yes, it goes back. And actually it shows Griffith was one of the few thinkers about what the place would be like after um, independence. It is maybe it is one of the problems of the revolutionary generation. It was the wolf tone that Britain is the never-ending source of all our ills. Uh, let's get rid of them and then we'll know what to do. Mm. Uh, maybe there is that lack of thinking beforehand and Griffith is one of the few, so he's one of the few people they have to fall back on. Okay. Um, Bridges, in terms of, uh, I mean, we've talked a bit about the state, uh, the role of the state, um, how it's a bigger role than, than perhaps the, the uh, um, Anglo-Saxon model would, uh, would say. Did we become successful or more successful when the state led, um, I mean, Arden Crush is, is, is one example, the semi-states during the 1930s, first programme for economic expansion. It, it devolved on the state because there wasn't an entrepreneurial class that perhaps could take Ireland forward. I, I mean, I, I, I think Sean O'Rean's work on the developmental, flexible developmental state captures all of this, that, that Ireland had, to, the Irish state had to do this because the private sector couldn't do it. There wasn't a private sector. And when we, when we uh, protected industry in the 1940s and 50s, we ended up with poor products because there was no competition. So thread that you couldn't sew with because it split, shoes that the soles would come off, etc., etc. Very poor standards because of the lack of competition. It was also, I think, we the injection of uh, foreign investment because foreign investment brought capital, it brought jobs, but it also brought managerial capacity to the society. And if you look at the history of, say, and it, not just American multinationals, but, but, but predominantly so, you began to see Irish managers making their way through the Irish, the local companies, and then suddenly someone Irish is heading the company in, in the States or whatever. So I think the managerial competence of the society dramatically increased from the 1970s on. And I would also uh, say that the return of, 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 of the Irish who'd worked abroad, again, another injection of competence from other places. And I, w I think what if, if one thinks of the critical junctures and we've talked about the absolute centrality of the early 30s, I would say the, the, the sort of the 50s into the 60s, you know, that, that's another, Ireland gets, a, there's another step change. Mm. And again, even on the, whole, uh, on, the, on the whole values and equality, I mean, it took an awful long time for church-state relations for that conflict to emerge in Irish but society. But that competence, that, that developmental... Um, energy, that comes on the back of spectacular failure. Oh, and the yeah. population of the Republic was less yeah, than yeah. 3 million yeah. by 1961. The scale of the exodus of the emigration 
and how the historian might even begin to, to grasp the enormity of that, the dislocation that's involved. The sense of Ireland as a failed state and the repeated use of the word failure is interesting in the late 1950s that some of those senior civil servants, including the yes. best known of them, T.K. Whittaker, they're framing their mission in very human terms because the parents of Ireland are wondering, are their children going to have a future uh, in Ireland? Um, it comes on the back of, of, of terrible failure. And we do need to think about those who felt they had no stake in the country. Absolutely. Tom Murphy, the playwright, captured that very well in the late 1950s. Come on out of here to hell. You know, yep. what is here for those people? Um, and there's great trauma internalised there. And, you know, we've had an awful lot of revelation in the last few decades about the scale uh, of, of the denial and the power alliances and the hiding um, and, and what could and could not be discussed and seen. And um, that theme of how those socio-moral power alliances worked and those who, who felt they were excluded. Uh, and even going back to 1922, I was looking at a group of uh, Cumann Amman women in, in, in West Kerry. There were 257 women in Cumann Amman in West Kerry. 109 of them had left by the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, and we forget that sometimes. They don't have a stake in the country. Now, it's not just because of, of the Civil War. It's also because they're West Kerry mm. uh, and there are very few economic opportunities there. But again, that, you know, those who were, uh, for all the talk of, of the state and its successes uh, and, and the changes that came about, there are an awful lot who just do not have that future and who do not feel they have any stake in the country. And Maria, as you, you were saying earlier, I mean, that is very much comes through the, the pension mm -hmm. collection and, and archival sources like that. Yes, it certainly does. But I think just to pick up the point of Bridges of the late 50s and 60s, I think the, the investment in education report in the 1960s, and I think one of my, if I'm allowed, mention some heroes from uh, 20th century Irish history. I think Paddy Hillary is in his time as Minister for yes. Education, for me as a, as a historian, um, stands out there. And I think you could see it's investment in education is the name of the report. It could just as well be seen as education for investment. And everything yeah. stems from that. Yeah. The de declining influence of the Catholic Church in education stems from it because of the expanding numbers at post-primary means that the, the numbers of religious as teachers are no longer sufficient to provide the teaching. So you have the influx of yeah. the lay teachers and of obviously more laicization after Vatican II as well. So you have a dilution of, uh, of influence there. But for me, that, that is the key yeah. point. And maybe it's linked to the question about the revolutionary generation. Hillary um, and uh, Donna O'Malley and George Colley, who George Colley had a very brief period in education, but he took that very important and very unpopular decision in rural Ireland of closing down the small schools. And we still see these, many of these schools are now mm. translated into Bijou residences in rural <laughs> Ireland. But it was not easy for him coming no. from a Dublin constituency to tell the local school in Carpenterstown, which is one I can think of locally, um, no, you're closing and you're getting, kids are getting on the bus and they're going to, mm. the, mm. going to school in Castle Pollard. That wasn't an easy decision to make, but they took the hard decisions. Maybe it was that there was a bit of youth, there were, there were the post, there were the, the first generation born in independent Ireland, but for me, the investment in education, I have a copy of the report at yep. home on my uh, shelves. It's hugely important. Okay, and that led on to, to so much. Actually, there's a, a related question uh, from Anonymous, and it's something Bridget was talking about earlier, but the inward versus outward facing, and, and the uh, questioner says, to what extent is that due to university education being too influenced by the UK first and then the US, big states on a world scale, and therefore presumably lessons that aren't particularly relevant for us? No, three academics, don't you like? What do you think I'm about that? I'm not entirely sure how they think of our... Uh, I mean, y yes, Irish universities are... Th there's a British and Irish system, but I have worked in both university systems, and I see the, the Irish one has kind of grown its own yep. way of doing things. So I, I, I think the it, things maybe things which have helped a lot are Erasmus programs, which mm. we in the in, in Queen's will now, one of the terrible uh, atrocities of Brexit is that we won't have that uh, access anymore. So I, I'm not sure I'm inclined to agree with <laughs> we the were, presumption. We were here uh, not so long ago to mark the 50th anniversary uh, of Ireland's vote to join the EEC, as it was then. And I was making the point that when I left school in 1989, we were addressed 
before we left the school and we were called educated young Europeans mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'd never been called that before. Uh, <laughs> educated I, young or European? E educated young Europeans. <laughs> was the combination of all three the that, That's an interesting way uh, for us to think about ourselves um, and it was a deliberate change of language. Yeah. And this, Bridget, is, is what you were touching on earlier. This is the coming out from under the shadow of, of Britain that the EU allowed us. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I, I even, so I, I, I left university in 1976. I happened to go to the College of Europe in Bruges. So I was in and out of Brussels in the very early years of Ireland's membership. And you could see the impact on individual Irish civil servants over those early years, the first 10 years of EU membership, where they began to open up, they weren't afraid, they began to, they were able to articulate an Irish view as opposed to listening to the, the, their UK counterpart. And so I think what it did was, it, it isn't that, the UK was still a very important partner, but it just loosened the psychological pressure of this asymmetric relationship. And sitting round the table, you were you, beside the Germans or when, whatever. And I think it really made a difference. We know it made a difference to Anglo-Irish relations mm. in terms of all those agreements that uh, the informal contacts through the European system really, uh, really mattered. And also, because this system has a lot of policy learning in it, uh, you're listening to what the Danes were doing or the, you know, the French were doing on something. So I think it just loosened that dominance of the relationship. But also, and this is the shock to the British on Brexit, they genuinely, uh, Theresa May said to Donald Tusk, when he said it was about the, the having to solve the Irish uh, border in the first round in the divorce and not in the future relationship. And she said, Ireland is a small country. We're much more important. This is what she said. And he, Donald Tusk looked at him with his Polish author, looked at her with his Polish author and said, Ireland is a member state. End of story. <laughs> And it really, one of the reasons why the British were behind the curve on the protocol all the time is they genuinely thought, genuinely thought Ireland would be peeled off at some stage. Mm -hmm. And I know that they, they the, the British Foreign Office had a full court press against the Irish position from start to finish. The idea that this wasn't a battle underneath, it was a tremendous battle to get the question on the agenda for the divorce to keep it there and to keep the unity. And that required a level of attention from our civil servants, our diplomats, but also our politicians. And the other thing that emerged from this is the UK was this very polarised uh, politics now. And the, the opposition in Ireland to the every MEP in Strasbourg and, and Brussels worked the Irish question. So, the, and I, uh, Dermot's absolutely right that the, the, the success, the later success of the Irish state was built on abject, abject failure. But some countries never actually have, get out of the failure. Mm. So, I always use Argentina as the salutary example <laughs> of a once rich country that just gets it wrong and never gets it right again. So we have managed to, to drag ourselves up from from that failure and i do think the investment in education was okay let's not get carried away though that there's no such thing as a free lunch in europe either you oh know? no they, they may still come looking for indeed a and, bill and to be paid those those german oh, they, car, they car makers have. are those German car makers are going to make their presence felt any day now. Now, we're, we're actually almost running out of time. I just want to uh, ask one of the last question here, again from Anonymous. I don't know whether it's the same Anonymous or not. <laughs> uh, the decade of centenaries brought history back into focus. How can this investment be sustained and new communities be encouraged to be part of this process? So the decade of centenary is nearly at an end. I don't know whether we're I happy know, or we, sad we, about we that. We have to keep going to 2032 <laughs> for the handover of power. Um, <laughs> at least. Um, and then should we keep going for a bit longer? Uh, I, I, I'm glad this, this question has come up because it is, this is one of UCD's uh, a number of conferences and a number of other decade of centenary events 
Prince, and I'd like to pay a tribute to Connor and ev all the uh, executive Here. centenaries team in UCD. <laughs> no. Not just, and I, I, I mean the entire team, if I, I mentioned everyone, that I wouldn't have time, but things like uh, new, the newspaper supplements with The Independent, they brought this level of history to a new audience, and I think that's, uh, we have broadened that influence. It's important for the new Irish. Uh, I think you could see it in 19, the 1916 commemorations and the um, children from families who were clearly new Irish engaging with it, understanding the state that they now lived in and probably were, were born in. So I think that, that that's important. I would also just like to say another legacy of it is we can have this conversation, we can go into it, these in-depth analysis because of the archival, the quality of the archival material. Uh, Pe Lindsay mentioned most of them, so I won't uh, go into as much detail. But I think one thing that came from the decade of centenaries, not just in seeing all these new archives, but was the Beyond 2022 project based in Trinity, which showed us what happened when you lose your archive. And one th the, the investment there in recapturing the old archive destroyed in 1922 is yet another one of the, the wonderful legacies of the cent decade. Just a final concluding thought from you, yourself, dear. I'm very conscious that the reason why the Military Pensions Archive is available is because the Department of Defence agreed that it should be available. Mm -hmm. There are departments of defence that would not agree to that. And it's important. There has been an enlightened and quite liberal approach uh, and there has been considerable investment there and we need to acknowledge it, as there should be in a country where history, thankfully, is taken very seriously, uh, not just by academics, uh, but by people who own this ultimately, and that's what this decade of commemorations ultimately was supposed to be about. Uh, but I think they, they, for me, are the most important legacies, that that material will be available, that they'll go on releasing that material, and that it will be contextualised and mediated um, it's not just about digitising. I mean, these digitisation projects are marvellous, uh, but the material does need to be mediated. It does need to be contextualised. Uh, it's not gospel, uh, you know, and we need to understand that uh, we have to be careful in how we treat all of our sources. But the fact that we have such an abundance and wealth of sources now is one of the towering legacies of, of this decade. OK, I'll give a final word to Bridget, uh, seeing as you're the political scientist here. Um, well, it, well I, I learned, I, I wasn't able to be here yesterday, but I learned so much today of new and fresh material. And I think that's, it's, it's wonderful that, that, the, that the archives are being released, that they're rich uh, and that we can uh, interrogate our past. And hopefully we won't be Argentina, but that we can look forward to a better future. Great. OK, well, that is a lovely note on which to end this. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank our wonderful signers for their hard work and our three panellists. Give them a round of applause, please. Ladies and gentlemen, here in the audience and online, it is my great pleasure to draw this uh, conference to a close. Not my great pleasure because it's over, but my great pleasure because it has been such a wonderful event from start to finish. And I think all of our contributors, chairs and speakers today deserve a sincere round of applause. I want to thank you, the audience, for being here, both in person and online. Through uh, the Q&A that have come in through our chairs, there's been a wonderful discourse that's been happening here in the room, through the chairs, on Twitter, and we've also been broadcast on RTE today, and I want to thank RTE for their role in bringing this to a much wider audience. Article 17 of the Anglo-Irish Treaty set a clock ticking on Ireland's provisional government. A hundred years ago right now, there were 72 hours of legitimate government remaining in the provisional government. Within 12 months of the 6th of December 1921, the date the treaty had been signed, the Irish Free State had to be up and running. And the, tradition, tr sorry, the transitional authority of the provisional government would lapse. In normal circumstances, undertaking the necessary work to frame and ratify a constitution and set and train the various infrastructures and architectures to underpin a state would have been challenging. To have achieved this in wartime remains a remarkable achievement of democratic perseverance. An important element of the decade of centenaries has been to revisit and, where necessary, to revise the chronology of Ireland's revolutionary decade. Often the emphasis on the Civil War has eclipsed what occurred simultaneously. 
I welcome the opportunity in this conference today and yesterday to examine politics, social and cultural developments in the round. Those that occurred concurrent to events and also just as this panel has done to project forward and look at what was achieved through both the military and the political and social developments that have brought us to this point in this young republic's history. I think there's an immense plurality of opinion that has emerged through the decade of centenaries. And I welcome the discourse that both academics, politicians and the public have brought, where multiple overlapping and conflicting views can be aired in a true spirit of Republic discourse within this decade of centenaries. This last panel has brought us right the way through this and shown us a diverse range of topics which really enlighten our understanding and bring us from 1922 right the way through to 2022. As we just mentioned with the teaching of history, emphasising and underlining just how important an understanding of our past is to where we are in the present. And as the panellists have welcomed, I welcome the fact that history remains a compulsory subject on the junior cert and that generations of students to come in the secondary curriculum and in the university curriculum will understand why where they stand in the present remains and rests on what they have come from before in the past. I want to thank everyone here today and I have some specific thanks to make as well. First and foremost to all our speakers and chairs, to everything they've brought to this rich and varied programme. Your achievement has been the success of this conference. I want to thank Professor Orla Feely, the Vice President of Research, Impact and Innovation here in UCD, for her constant guidance and support of this project, which she co-funded through UCD and the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media. We want... Thank you. In the department, with the very long name, I want to thank Minister Catherine Martin, uh, as well as two of her uh, team in particular, Orla Lochran and Sinead Copeland, who sat on our organising committee and offered invaluable insight, guidance and support throughout the realisation of this project. I want to pay particular tribute to Dr Morris Manning. As chair of the expert advisory group on commemorations, he has been one of the leading forces in the entire decade of centenaries. And I know many members of the EAG have spoken on our panels and are sitting in this room today. But Morris, you really have driven that initiative, but you also drove this conference from the start and those early conversations between Ailish O'Brien, yourself, Orla Feely and myself really kicked everything that occurred today forward. So a particular thanks to you. There's um, nothing that happens without a huge team of people in the background and a large committee was convened in order to make this possible. And I want to name them individually for all their work and tireless effort that they brought to this conference. Professor David Farrell, Professor Dermot Ferreter, Donald Byrne from RTE, Ailish O'Brien from University Relations, Professor Eugenio Biagini, um, the Honourable Mr Justice Gerard Hogan, Jenny Costello, who I'll mention, uh, and you can hold your applause for her uh, until the end, um, Professor Margaret O'Callaghan, Professor Mary E. Daly, Dr. Mary McAuliffe, Dr. Morris Manning, Professor Michelle Norris, Professor Orla Feely, Orla Lochran, Professor Regina Culliton, Professor Robert Gervart, Dr. Sandra Collins, um, Sinead Copeland and Dr. Thomas Moore. In university relations, there's a whole team led by Eilish O'Brien and in particular, I want to pay tribute to Mary Staunton and Sinead Kelly, who did so much administrative work behind the scenes and also did um, invisible but invaluable work over the two days, particularly Mary, for all your work and the things that go unseen but without which things will never happen. So thanks to you and all the team in university relations. In the College of Arts and Humanities, I want to thank Professor Eugenia Culliton, our new college principal, who was also a member of our committee and did invaluable work and uh, I suppose now I can finally say that the Irish language translation of the programme is um, very much down to Regina's tireless effort, her oversight and her not just insistence but her champion of the, of the Irish language throughout this. So Regina, to you there's particular thanks for the realisation that Gaelga is Jackson Cunnishan. Gormila Magath.
in the College of Arts and Humanities, before I leave that space, Emer Beasley in the marketing department and all her team, and in the School of History, Darcy Jackson, Claire Gibney, um, and Roisin Cawley in the School of History. At UCD Library, Sandra Collins, Kate Manning and her team at UCD Archives, Evelyn Flanning, Flanagan and her team at, at Special Collections, Christor McCarthy and his team at the National Folklore Collection, and Catherine Bodie um, and the team who organised the exhibition which we saw yesterday in the Conservatory of O'Reilly Hall. I want to thank Donald Burke for all his work in liaising between UCD and RTE and making sure that this conference was available to a much wider audience through the various multimedia platforms at RTE. And again, this has really shaped our spirit of inclusivity within the conference that we can reach as wide an audience as possible with the brilliant and accessible content that all our speakers and panels have brought to this today. Uh, I want to thank first Nigelka, again in the spirit of inclusivity, who supported the Irish language panel today. August, um, just the Vichy Harbour. It, it was wonderful that job. people um, were so here that took part in the, Lord, the debate um, or part I want of the to debate. Thank our simultaneous translators, Alina Hulavon and Sean Atulawan, Sue Sabuska. I was up there for part of the conference today and it was like standing next to the commentary box uh, at a sporting event. Uh, they were fantastic and I don't know how they kept up with the pace and I might slow down my own <laughs> thanks as I, as I say that in a self aware manner, but they did a phenomenal job. Job. Um, also, I think the Dreacht that we see, the magic from the simultaneous um, Irish Sign Language uh, interpreters today, Pauline McMahon and Darren Daly here in the room. Thank you very much. <laughs> I welcome and thank all our Irish Sign Language community who have tuned in online or maybe who are here in the room and have been able to access this through the interpreters. Thank you so much for your work and for really delivering on UCD's aspiration of making this as accessible as it possible to so many diverse publics. In the simultaneous interpretation company limited, I want to thank Kevin McMorrow for coordinating this effort also. Um, our conference assistants here today who have done so much behind the scenes, Dermot Lyons and Neve Mungle. Lanny um, of the MA in Public History here in UCD, and yesterday, Cara de Zemla, Sam Windle, and uh, Shane Lynch, uh, not he of Boyzone. Um, uh, at the UCD Student Centre, uh, I would uh, like to thank um, Robert Mully and all his team who provided such wonderful hospitality for us today and opened this venue, the Fitzgerald Debating Chamber, up to us. You've been fantastic in facilitating our every request with such grace um, and professionalism. I want to thank our AV team, Alan Finn, and all his team at AV Partners for really delivering on the best of what the pandemic, if we can look at any silver linings, have brought in terms terms of making this accessible to people online through RTE in Irish, in English and in ISL. It really is a feat of modern technology and you really have shown the industry leading uh, credentials that you have in that field. I want to pay particular thanks to Jenny Costello, who has been the guiding light behind this conference from the get-go. Her project management skills have ensured that everything you have seen and heard today has been available to you, that it has run without a hitch. And even when there may have been tiny hiccups in the background, her skill at seeing them before they happened and stopping them out of the pass have meant that Everyone, I think, tuning in has seen a seamless um, realisation of everything that was done here today. So, Jenny, thank you for all your work from start to finish on this. Je Jenny, please come forward. <laughs> so this is Jenny Costello, who has really been mentioned so many times today. So... Myself and Jenny have been harassing speakers, chairs have been, uh, Jenny's been writing minutes of the conference organising committee. So Jenny, thank you so much for all your work. You've been absolutely fantastic in this. I hope there's nobody I've failed to mention, but I know that this has been a massive collaborative team effort, not just here in UCD, but throughout various um, groups, organisations um, who have assisted us in organising this conference. The proceedings of the conference, there will be uh, papers, I'm sure, emerging in the scholarship, but the live stream of this conference will remain live on Centenary's 
www.ucd.ie. So please visit that website if you'd like to look back on any of the panels in English or in Irish. And I would just like to include by uh, saying Gurumila Magav Galer as Dakrud or Rinishivan Shah. For everything you did and you or if you heard here today, it was wonderful and thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome and best of luck to you and safe home. Thank you.